Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise here tonight. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. I know it's a Wednesday night. I understand that. But did you come to worship the Lord? Amen. I'm not going to let no rock take my place in worshiping the one true living God that is still on the throne. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated here tonight. Thank you for coming to the house of the Lord. Amen. Once again, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. And I want to be in the presence of God. But thank you so much for coming. Amen. Taking your time out of your busy week. Amen. To come and worship God here tonight. Amen. We want to thank all of our guests here. Amen. That are here. We want to say thank you for uh, coming here tonight. Amen. Worshiping God with us. Amen. Just go ahead and mark your name where you're sitting, and, and that's where you can sit. Amen. Praise God. But thank you for coming here tonight. Let's also not forget our tithes and offering boxes. Amen. They're located in the back of the building. Also, you can go online. Amen. And give that way. Amen. Because God loves a cheerful giver here tonight. Amen. Men's fellowship. Men say 9 a.m. 9 a.m. this Saturday here at the church. Amen. We're going to have a wonderful time. Amen. In, in, in fellowship. We're going to be doing some things around the church. And then afterwards, we're going to have a great time of fellowship and just, man, being men. Amen. We can talk about anything and our wives don't won't bug us, won't mess with us. We can leave anytime we want to. Amen. <laughs> I can say that because my wife is over there. <laughs> Amen. But, man, let's not forget that this Saturday at 9 a.m. Also, this Sunday, back to school prayer. Amen. It's going to be in the p.m. service. Amen. You don't want to miss it. Amen. We're going to be praying over our children uh, of, of the year to come, and our children need prayer. Amen. They need the hedge of prayer uh, about their life. Amen. So please be here. That's going to be this Sunday, p.m. service. Also, mark your calendar. Epic is going to be uh, for Section 7 Youth Rally Friday, August the 9th at 9 p.m. Now, I, I, I understand that this is going to be for the youth. I get that. But we need you here as well. Amen. Because tell you what, the past couple of years that we've been here, I've kind of sat in the back, I've let the kids do their thing, and I, I was able to worship my own way back there, and I got a blessing. You don't have to be 12 or 13 to get a blessing. You can be 99 years old and get a blessing. Amen. Now, I get it once again, this is for our youth, but I promise you, if you will make yourself available for this, God's going to bless you. Amen. So let's not forget that Friday, August 9th here at the church at 7 p.m. Amen. In Luke chapter 5, it talks about a very familiar passage of where Jesus walks up to the shore of the boat and he sees Peter and all of them fishing. And the people, the Bible depicts, were following him and, he, and Jesus was teaching the people. And so he steps in the boat and he asks Peter to cast him out. And so you'd see him just kind of floating out. And he's still teaching these people, but the people are on the shoreline. They're sitting there, but they're listening to the master, but they stop short at the shoreline. I'm sure their feet might get wet from time to time as the waves come in. I'm sure that the sand would get in between their toes, but you see, they didn't go any further because they were listening to the master. It wasn't long that everything was done, and Peter uh, or Jesus told Peter, get your nets, and I want you to throw them. Cast them out into the deep. Now you can imagine Peter, as they were tired from the night toiling, the Bible says, they were, they were tired from, from catching nothing, but they were obedient to the master. And so they go out and they cast out in the deep, and we see that their nets come back so full that they have to get the other boats to help bring the catch in, the blessing in. You see, as I begin to read this, begin to allow this story to filtrate down to my heart, I begin to think, here is the master in the boat, Jesus, the one that can heal all things, the one that is bringing life unto the people, and here they sit at the shoreline. But yet the blessing is out in the deep. 
Here they are sitting, allowing their feet to get wet when all they had to do is wade out into the deep. I want to ask you here tonight as they begin to sing here again. You may have problems. You may be going through some stuff this week. I want to tell you, don't sit on the shoreline and allow the waters and the blessings of God to merely go across your feet. It's out in the deep is where you're going to get your blessing. It's out in the deep when you make yourself available to God and wait out. As we begin to sing, are you going to go out into the deep here tonight? Are you going through some things in your life and you need God to move? Start waiting. Start waiting out into the deep because that's where your blessing is. Darkness, my God, that is who you are. 
hope you're glad that you know who he is. Why don't you lift your voice and praise him? He said, I am the Lord, I change not. I'm glad that I serve a faithful God that is consistent. I know who he is. I can count on him, on being who he is faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he was good yesterday, you can lift your voice and praise him because he is the same. That's who he is. Amen. He is a good God. And the church said amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord this evening. It is such an honor to be here. I, uh, I know some of you are not familiar with who I am. And I highly considered introducing myself. But the more I considered what I would say. I had to begin to repent of the lies I was going to tell you about how awesome I am. But rest assured, it was going to be the introduction of the ages for myself. But we will simply, concisely state that it is an honor to be here. And my name is uh, Reverend Chad Roberts. And uh, we are so very thankful for the privilege to be here uh, this evening and to share the word of the Lord with you. I woke up this morning in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, so I've come a long way to have church. And I hope that you have come to have church tonight. We were in St. Louis Bible quizzing. It's a Bible quizzing is very dear and near to our hearts. Uh, we, uh, it almost cost me my life a couple years ago. We were um, serving, I was serving as our Texas District Secretary and we had a youth conference and one of our speakers was up preaching to our youth and I had me and my wife and our children there and um, evidently at one point he did not receive the response that he anticipated because he made the statement, do I need to say that again for those sitting in the back? And... Uh, I didn't think anything about it that night, but the very next night I was quoting uh, my son in our bedroom and my wife was quoting the other son in our living room and it just so happened that we were uh, quoting that year uh, from the writings that state, wives submit to your husband. And he quoted that statement and he looked at me and I've been married long enough, no, not to amen that moment. You just go on. And I smiled at him. I didn't say anything. And that little jerk piped up. Dad, do I need to say that again for mom sitting in the back? And I watched my life flash before my very eyes. And uh, I heard, yeah, Dad. And we just moved on. But Bible quizzing about cost me my life that day. But we're thankful for the Lord that grace and mercy prevailed. And uh, we were able to go this past year. My oldest son qualified for nationals. And they won fourth place in the intermediate division national Bible quizzers. So we're very proud of them. It's been a very busy week. Uh, but that's the reason why we were in St. Louis uh, this morning. Woke up, flew in today and so very privileged to be with y'all in this place this evening. I do want to say what a privilege it is to be with my friend and your music director, Brother Horsley. God bless Brother Dwayne Horsley. Amen. Love and appreciate him for so many reasons. We share a common commitment, and that is God gave us the privilege to serve at Texas Bible College. Amen, and I thank him for his years of service to that ministry. It means so very much to me as a graduate and then as an instructor of TBC uh, and for almost eight, nine years serving as a board member for TBC. I love Texas Bible College, but he also had the added blessing or privilege of putting up with my mother-in-law 
the entire time he was on staff. She works in the music department. Uh, so God bless Brother Horsley for that blessing. Amen. But we love and appreciate the Horsleys and praying for, of course, Sister Horsley and her family uh, during their time of loss. So if you have your Bibles, if you will, stand with me this evening. And we will turn your attentions to the writings of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number 1, chapter 11, verse number 1. A very familiar passage of Scripture, but I help, I pray with the help of the Holy Ghost and your patience tonight that we can walk out better than we walked in. Everybody said amen. I want us to walk out better than we walked in this, this evening. And the word of the Lord simply says in the writings of Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. Your patience for the next little while if I can. I would like to talk to us simply on this thought, faith. Everybody say faith. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing in honor of the word of the Lord. You may be seated this evening. We find another time that is a lot more challenging where faith is mentioned. And we, I didn't give this scripture to our sound and media personnel. But in Mark the fourth chapter verse number 40. Jesus says unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And what an indictment. What an indictment that is from the Lord. And I would like to, if I can, help us to understand how do we get from a place where God would look at us and say, How is it that ye have no faith? to walking in the description effectively and fervently that is given to us by the writer of Hebrews. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. I want you to know that faith is meant to be substantial. It's not meant to be weak. It's not meant to be anemic. It's not meant to be Leslie Fair and easy come and easy go, but faith, biblical faith, is meant to be able to sustain you for the rest of your walk with God. I refuse to buy into a mentality of in and out, up and down, come and go, moved and waved with every wind and every problem and every circumstance, but I want to be consistent. I want a faith that is substantial. I want a faith that will hold me and keep me and secure me. I don't know about you, but I intend to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And I will not get there without faith. So I want faith. And if we are honest with ourselves this evening, each and every one of us, no matter if we are the most seasoned saint or we are the newest of converts, uh, we would all would say, honestly, I want to be known as a person of faith. I don't want to be the individual that walks in and everybody's not sure if they're going to be consistent. I want to be known as a person of faith. So what then is faith? If we look to the original wording of faith, uh, amen, that word faith in Hebrews 11 and 1 in the Greek uh, is pestis, uh, and it means to rely upon a persuasion, uh, a moral conviction. Uh, it is an assurance, a belief, uh, a faith. Uh, it is uh, a conviction of the truth of something. Faith is a conviction that something is is true, which lets me know <laughs> that tonight, without truth, you cannot have faith. You can amen that, it's okay. Without truth, you cannot have faith. 
The first thing that you've got to have if you want to be a person of faith is you've got to have truth. This is not an option on the road to faith. This is mandatory. The Word of God, the truth, amen, is not something that you can either take or leave. It is something that you must pick up, prescribe to, and hold on to. If you're going to have faith, I wish somebody would help me tonight. You've got to have truth. I can't have faith if it's a lie. It's not faith. It will not substantiate. It will not hold me up. If it's not truth, it will let me down. And faith, amen, has got to be something substantiated. It's got to be something I can rely on. If it's going to be biblical faith, I can believe in a lie and be damned, the word tells me. And I don't want that. I want to make it. So I've got to have something that will hold me up. That means I've got to have the truth. We can't pick and choose the passages uh, that uh, read uh, into our persuasion and into our perspective, but rather we've got to give ourselves up to the truth. Uh, in other words, we've got to take our hands uh, off of this book uh, and say, you know what, I'll handle you, but rather allow it to handle us uh, and say, if it's in this book, I, I need it because uh, without faith, uh, I am not substantiated. Without faith, uh, there is nothing sound uh, there's nothing strong. I don't know about you, but I thank God for truth because I can believe in that. I can have a conviction of it and know that it won't let me down. You might let me down. Life might let me down. The job might let me down. Health could let me down. But the word of God, as long as I'm building my convictions upon it, it will not let me down. Oh, you Pentecostals, uh, y'all are that black book believing people. Yeah, we are because we build our walk with God not off a of religion, not off an organization, but off of the word of the Lord because that's what's going to substantiate whether or not we hear well done. I've got to have truth. So we ask ourselves, where then does faith come from? Paul would write to the church of Rome and he would state it concisely. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word hearing in Romans 10 and 17 is a koe and it is a ear or frame or something that is heard. And the root word of that is a kuo which means to give audience to. So if we read it with understanding it lets us know that faith cometh by giving audience to and giving audience to the word of God. I want you to know to Today, despite what every blab it and grab it, name it and claim it, easy believism you want to prescribe to tries to tell you faith does not come by what you produce outwardly, but faith comes by what you allow to come inwardly somewhere along the way. If I'm going to be a man of faith, I got to learn to shut my mouth and open my ears and give audience and say, God, my faith isn't going to come by what I say but my faith is going to come when I open up my ears and give audience to the word of God I don't know about you tonight but I want to hear from God I want faith to grow so I'm going to open up my heart and say God not what I have to say tonight but if you've got something for me let me hush and open my heart and hear what your word would speak to my life Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Give me a preacher. Give me a pulpit. Give me a church. Give me a people that love the word. And I promise you, you'll not want for faith. You'll be a mighty man and a mighty woman of faith as long as you give audience to the word. We think faith comes, well, I'm going I'm I'm to produce faith in my life and I'm going to begin to speak some things out. Tell this mountain to be removed. That's the product of faith. 
it's not the source of faith. Faith produces the action of proclamation. God can save you. God can change you. God's going to do something great here tonight. That is the product of faith. But what is the source? How do you know that? Where did it come from? Because I read and I gave audience and he said he's not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance. I read, I gave audience to he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can think wherever two or three are gathered. What makes you think God? can move in this house today I'll tell you where I think it because I gave audience and God is in this house and God is in this place I feel his presence and I've got his word so I can preach with faith God is here God is here anything can happen you can receive what you need you can walk out blessed why do you declare that so boldly I gave audience to the word of God I gave audience to the word of God that's where faith comes from we try to produce faith in ourselves and in our product and what we profess it isn't in what you profess it's in what he professes It's been said there's a reason God gave us two ears and one mouth. I'll let you marinate. When it comes to growing in God, He doesn't need to hear from me nearly as much as I need to hear from Him. When it comes to growing in God, it, He already knows the thoughts and the intents of my heart. I need to know what His thoughts are. His ways are beyond mine. They're what I'm looking for. He knows the way that I take. He's not trying to figure me out. I'm trying to figure Him out. And if I can learn to give heed to the Word of the Lord and get hungry and I show up service after service and I say, Preacher, preach whatever is in this word I need it I want it I'm hungry for it then I can grow as a person and walk out with greater faith so that I can look at my co-worker and say God can heal you God can mend your marriage God can turn your world around where did you get that from I got it from the word of the Lord I heard that he is able to move through with and for us And when we give audience to the word of God, faith comes. When we give audience to what God would speak. Because until you hear it, you can't develop a conviction about it. You can't be convicted of something you're not familiar with. You just don't do that. He said it this way in Romans. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live, how? By faith. That means, there's no loopholes. I've looked for them, folks. There's no shortcuts. The just shall live by faith, by your convictions. I don't have to be in the Holy Ghost I don't need a prophetic word from God to know wow, how and where you're at all I have to do is look at how you're living and I can discern the convictions of your life because the Bible says that you're going to live according to your convictions if you're not convicted that church attendance is important then you won't be here if you're not convicted that loving God with all your heart mind and strength then your heart won't be in it 
it. I want you to know today, friend, you're going to live according to your convictions. I don't know about you, but if I'm convicted of something, let it be the word of God. If something's going to guide my direction and establish my steps, let it be the word of God. I want to live by the word. I want to live by the convictions of the word of the Lord. Pastor doesn't even have to go to Facebook and stalk you. He just looks at your convictions and knows what kind of life you're living and knows the truths that you hold dear. If the word of the Lord is true, and it is, and the just shall live by convictions, what then is a conviction? It was in 1796, a church in Ohio was sued for having a Christian school. The case would eventually make its way to before the Supreme Court and the decision of ultimately about what was going on in this case uh, was based upon uh, whether or not the church had the right to have a school, but rather what a conviction was defined as. Uh, David Gibbs was the attorney that argued the case uh, before the Supreme Court, uh, and the court ruled uh, that there are five criteria that something, uh, amen, is required to have in order to be defined uh, as a conviction. Uh, they also, in this hearing, uh, defined the fact that the only thing covered by the First Amendment was convictions and not preferences. I want you to know, friend, that preferences are not what you live your life by because preferences change. Conviction is what you're going to live your life by. I don't want to walk by preference. I want to walk by conviction. I want it to be more than just how I feel today and what suits me now, but I want it to be rain or shine. This is who I am, and this is what I believe, and this is going to be my identity. Five criteria in order for it to be classified as a conviction. The first is peer pressure will not cause you to change it. The second is family pressure would not cause you to change it. The third is the threat of jail. The fourth is the threat of lawsuit. And finally, the fifth and ultimate criteria is you would have to be willing to die for it in order for it to be a qualified conviction according to the Supreme Court. Doesn't matter what my friends are doing. This is who I am. If mom and daddy don't live this way, I'm going to live this way. If my spouse doesn't want all that Pentecostalism, I'm still going to love God. Family pressure isn't going to cause me to change it. You can threaten to take my freedom, but I still believe this. You can threaten to take my finances, but I'm still going to believe this. And ultimately, I'm going to lay my life down for this conviction. So it begs the question, what are your convictions? David Gibbs went home that evening, gathered his family around the living room table and discussed their convictions. Uh, and he reached uh, the conclusion. He wrote about it. Uh, he said at the end, uh, he said the list of things uh, that they would die for was so very small. And I rise tonight uh, to this precious body of people and I ask you if you were to make a list uh, of the convictions uh, that you're willing to lay your life down for, what would that list look like what would be the items on it that you said no matter what it cost me I'm willing to lay my life down for it y'all remember Y2K I was a freshman at TBC in Houston and everybody said the world's coming to an end computers are shutting down the whole world's going to come to an end this is it the apocalypse the end of days I thought I believed it. Me and about four of my Bible college buddies, they were having it. They, they rented out the Astrodome. Huge conference. 
And all of us Bible college students were going to go there. We're going to, we were going to worship Y2K into. But before then, because it was the end of days, we had to reach as many. So we went to uh, La Fiesta, a little Hispanic. Everything was Hispanic where we were at in Houston. And we were putting leaflets in the windshields of all these vehicles in the parking lot. Trying to invite them, you got to come tonight. We got to be there. We got to pray. Amen. Y2K and two, because God's going to come and the end of time is upon us. Uh, and we got to reach them while we still have a chance. Until the security officer walked up and said, Guys, no soliciting. We said, Well, this is important. And he looked at us and he said, If you put one more leaflet on a windshield, you're all going to be arrested. I found out then that I wasn't convicted. Because I wasn't even willing to give up my liberty, my freedom, much less lay down my life. That moment has echoed in my heart and it will until the sounding of the trumpet or whether I go by the way of the grave, I will never forget that moment of definement of, Chad, you've got to really discern what is a conviction in your life. What are you willing to lay down your life for? And I began to begin to assess those convictions and areas of my life that are merely preferences versus those things that are convictions. And I rise today to inquire of you, what are the truths that you are convinced convicted of uh, sitting in these seats here this evening uh, if we were to ha- hold a trial of your faith uh, would there be enough evidence uh, to convict you uh, of those things you claim uh, a conviction of uh, would you get uh, a hung jury would there be deliberation uh, would there be a, a unanimous decision uh, would they be able to readily stand up uh, and say I know that Chad Roberts uh, believes that here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord because he's willing to lay his life down. And for that truth, is there enough conviction in my life for there to be evidence for there to say he truly believes that God inhabits the praises of his people because when he comes to church, he lifts his hands, he opens his mouth and he responds in adoration and worship is there enough evidence to convict me of those things that I say are convictions I held that baby girl in my hand a newly minted daddy Look down those pink cheeks, head full of hair. I was so jealous. I looked down in her face. I said, baby girl, this is daddy speaking. Shema Israel. Adonai Elohim. Adonai Ahad. Miranda, that means here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And baby girl, if God will tarry and be kind I'm going to introduce you to him someday because he's going to take care of you. I don't know about you but I'm convicted today that the next generation needs to know that there's one God and his name is Jesus and he's worthy of loving and serving and he's worthy of worship and praise. He's worthy of our fealty. He's worthy of living a life of conviction following after and serving him. I don't know about you, but like he said, I'm going to live by my faith. So if my faith is a facade, then so is the life I live. 
if my conviction of a truth is fake, then somewhere my walk in my life ceases to be real. And we've got to get to the point where we refuse a fake faith. Refuse a fake faith. Paul would write to his son Timothy and he would say it this way when I call to remembrance uh, the unfeigned faith uh, that is in thee that dwelt first uh, in thy grandmother Lois uh, in thy mother Eunice uh, I am persuaded uh, that in thee also and Paul writes to Timothy and he says son I see a faith I, I remember a faith in you uh, that came from your mother and your grandmother I rise to tell you today it is still important uh, that we pass on uh, this conviction uh, this lifestyle to the next generation uh, I refuse uh, to allow it to die with me why do you spend the time uh, in Bible quizzing why do you make church uh, and living for God the priority because I got four babies uh, that are following up after me and I gotta make sure they understand hey this is what it means uh, for mom and dad to live a life of conviction. I believe that faith ought to be generational. I'm going to say it this way. I refuse to buy into the attitude that third and fourth generation Pentecostals have got to water down and lose the compassion and the commitment and the purpose that was in their parents and grandparents. I want you to know that they can be as sold out if not more than we are today. They can be tomorrow and I refuse to lose them in any capacity, in any purpose Amen. I believe that we can pass on a faith of apostolic doctrine to the next generation. That's what he said. It was in your grandmother and in your mother. But the part that stands out to me is when he says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith. That word unfeigned is a unique word. It's, it's not a word that we use a lot in 2024. And it, 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 in the original Greek, uh, the root word is hypokritos. Uh, and, and this word is on hypokritos. It's, it's the alpha and the nu of the Greek, which is like the U and the N of the English. Uh, and, and Paul adds this uh, prefix to the root word hypokritos uh, and, and so that he can mean the opposite uh, of what hypokritos uh, and hypokritos uh, in, in the original Greek uh, where, is where we get our English word hypocrite from so Paul says when I call to remembrance the unhypocritical the opposite of a hypocrite faith but in Paul's day, when he uses the word hypocritos, it meant something then than it does today. For Paul's day and time, it meant an actor on a stage. You ever been to a theater, a live theater? You ever seen the doors, the pamphlets, the advertisements? Many times, they're characterized with two masks. One smiling and one frowning. And what it does is it symbolizes the ability of those inside to portray something that they are not simply by adding a mask to a reality. What you see is not what you get. It's a mask. And Paul said, when I call to remembrance the unmasked faith, I began to study, I began to wonder, Paul, where did you, where did you come into contact with this, this faith that so stirred you that you would remember it years later? How did you get here? 
Paul, where do you remember it? And it takes us back to Acts chapter 16. Paul is making one of his journeys and ministry. And the Bible says he came to Derb and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. Hey, Timothy. And Timothy was the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. And the Bible says, which was well reported about the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium, which lets me know that this son in the faith, this Timothy that came from a mixed breed relationship daddy was a Greek mom was a Jew mom was this way and daddy was that way he didn't come from the perfect family but he still had a faith that was well reported by the brethren that was there and the Bible says him Paul would have a go a little bit further Paul recognized something about the faith of this young boy even as a young boy and he said hey I want you to go a little bit further with me and I want us to do something and the Bible says that as they went through the cities in verse 4 they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and the elders that were at Jerusalem and hear what the outcome hear what the product is when we take the masks and we be apostolic the churches were established and increased anybody want revival anybody want revival Oh, I know you want something profound, uh, but I came something simple. Uh, I know you wanted something d- different, uh, but this is what I feel to give to you. If you want to grow, if you want the church to be established, uh, all it takes uh, is for you to take the mask off. Uh, forget the pageantry and the pop uh, and the circumstance. Uh, forget the political and the parading uh, and walk around and simply be apostolic Pentecostal and say, I'm just going to live by the word of God. I'm just going to walk in the truths that I'm convicted in. And if I can do that in Center, Texas, God can increase the church. Stand with me this evening. We try to make church growth and personal growth so profound and so prolific that it becomes impossible. Now it's simple. Just obey the word. Just simply follow the word. Heaven and earth will be moved. This won't. Heaven and earth pass away. This is established. Times will come. Governments will change. Uh, Politics will be moved. Uh, All these things. You look at our world right now. It is a parade uh, of mask after mask. Uh, Look at the Olympics. Uh, Look at the political scheme. Uh, Look at the world. Uh, It is so masked up. uh, So layered up. Uh, You don't even know what to believe uh, and what not to believe. Uh, But I've come on a Wednesday night uh, to tell you it's simple. You can believe in this. uh, And as long as you'll give ear to it as long as you open up your heart to it God will be able to add to his church I want to be a man of faith where do I go the world has all the masks that they need I say let's give them an opportunity amen in East Texas to find a sanctuary where they can walk in and there are no masks there are no pageantries it's just simple we love God and we obey his word and we are real to the core So on a Wednesday night, the simple question is this. Are you wearing a mask? I know it. It it, We can can be professionals at Pentecost. 
walk in with our smiles pasted on perfectly. But inside there's things going on that we, if we're just honest, God, if I was really walking by faith, I'd go straight to that altar. And I'd say, I need you again. Do you know it's okay to need God again? It's okay to lean on everlasting arms. It's okay to trust in His love. It's okay to run to mercy and grace. I wonder on a Wednesday night in Center, Texas, if it'd be all right for each and every one of us to step out of our pews and come around the front of a church and be honest and say, God, I'm removing any and all mask, and I'm just going to be open before you today. There's some areas in my life. It may not be sin. It may Maybe simply areas. I need to re-substantiate. I need faith in these areas again. So I'm going to come down to this altar and I'm going to open up my heart and allow you to speak and allow you to minister and I'm going to walk out with more faith than I walked in with. Come on, why don't you lift your voice? Why don't you open up your heart? Why don't you open up your mind and say, God, if I'm being honest, there's areas of my life I'm pretending in. And God, I want to get rid of the mask tonight. Come on. I can't do it for you. Your spouse can't do it for you. There's areas of our life that we hide and we we masquerade in uh, that only God uh, knows the truth. Uh, You and God are the only ones. Uh, Why don't you open up your heart uh, and say, God, I'm tired of pretending. Uh, I really want to walk in the faith uh, of your word. I really want to trust you. Come on, will you lift your voices? Open up your hearts on a Wednesday night. Make up in your mind, I'm taking the mask off. And God is going to be allowed to establish His church. And God is going to be allowed to add to His church because we refuse a mask. And we embrace a faith. Come on, as they sing, will you lift up your voice and let's talk to God and say, God, help us remove our mask tonight. Call me to be. I'll say yes.